Okay, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the class on Christology. Uh, I know it's quite a deep uh, subject that we are learning, deep insights, deep truths, uh, theology, but I hope it's exciting and hope you're learning and you're be being benefited from what uh, you are learning. Okay, it's, it's not just kind of becoming knowledge in your head, but it's something that uh, is also helping you to know more about this God that you serve, the God you worship, uh, having deeper insights and just leading you to trust in him more, put your faith more in him. And also it's leading you to praise and, uh, you know, just worship and honor this God who's so great, so infinite, so powerful, um, but yet so accessible, right? Um, so near to us, even though he's so great and awesome, like First Timothy chapter 6, uh, verse 16, I think says, no, he lives in unapproachable light who no man has seen and can see. But even though he is so great, so awesome, you know, uh, we have access to this God. We can approach him. We can, um, you know, uh, hear him. We can speak to him. We can, you know, unload our burdens to him. And it's just so wonderful to know that this great God, you know, who's so holy, uh, whose holiness is so great, so unapproachable that he's willing to, you know, uh, uh, relate with us. He's just, uh, uh, you know, he's just so high, but he's he's so close to us, so present, so uh, accessible. So that's just so wonderful about uh, who God is and uh, how he relates to us as mankind, okay? So before we continue with chapter 7, the purpose of incarnation, uh, we'll just pause for a word of prayer. Can one of you please lead us in prayer? The students don't have the mic, okay? So uh, can one of you lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? You want to use the mic? The mic is here. Yeah. Yeah, can you lead us in prayer, please? Yeah, put it on and lead us in prayer. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful morning, Lord. Lord Jesus, I submit all things into your, into your hands, Lord Jesus. But as we are going to study Christology, Lord Jesus, help us and give us wisdom and knowledge lord jesus and help us to gain more and more lord jesus thank you for everything thank you for ma'am and thank you for everything lord jesus in jesus name we pray amen amen okay so in um uh, chapter five we basically you know looked at uh, you know uh, trying to understand uh, what is the what incarnation is? How God took on uh, the human form. Uh, we examined also the humanity of Christ, and now we will look at the why of the um, incarnation. Okay, so we look at the why of the um, incarnation. In um, in chapter five, we try to understand uh, how Jesus was fully God, how Jesus is fully man, how he is true God, he is true man, uh, and how he lived here on the uh, earth. And when Jesus uh, became a man, uh, we saw that he did not cease to be eternally God. He was fully God, was fully man, okay? Uh, but we see that this eternal God, uh, you know, took on the fullness of humanity. Okay, very important to say that the, the eternal God took on the fullness of humanity not just part of humanity uh, to do his work but he took on the fullness of humanity uh, which means in body spirit and soul he was fully human and also we see in the way that he was he was born into this world he was through the natural conception and eh, sorry the conception not the natural conception but conception natural birth and growing up and becoming a man and the things that he uh, did okay so even as he became fully man uh, he was also fully deity he was fully god but he limited himself in the manifestations of his divinity 
okay which means that he did not he ceased to or he refrained from exercising or uh, expressing his omnipotence his omniscience and his omni present so he it was not that he did not have that in him he had it but he refrained or he stopped or he ceased or he stopped from uh, using it and he also we see that he took on the weaknesses and the frailties of the human flesh okay or the human body or human being and then we also looked at the seven steps of uh, incarnation which chapter do we find the uh, seven steps of the incarnation in Philippians, seven steps of incarnation, which chapter? Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8. So in that we saw the seven steps of incarnation, very, very important. Uh, we saw that Christ was in the form of God. He was equal with God, but he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay, and he made himself of no reputation. He took on the form of a born servant. He came in the likeness of man and he was found in the appearance as a man. Okay, so we see that, you know, um, even though he refrained from exercising or expressing his omniscience, his omnipotence and his uh, omnipresence, but we see what did he willingly give up? What did he willingly give up in his deity? His sonship glory, uh, uh, in, uh, not his sonship glory, he took on the sonship glory, but he gave up the glory of deity, of God. Why did he give up the deity of God? To be fully human? To be an example for us? To give us a sonship glory, okay? If he had his glory as deity, what would have happened? We could not approach him, we could not access him, we could not touch, see, you know, we can hear him, but he can't touch, see, and just have a tangible experience of the presence of God in uh, the human form okay and also what does it mean he did not uh, consider it robbery to be equal with god means what can you take the mic so that others can can you pass on the mic to her please if you have another mic you can have one this side and you can have one this side to be helpful yes even though it was something that uh, he owned or that he possessed he did not um he not think of it as something to keep it to himself. He left it. Okay, something to hold on to. So what did, he, to, yeah. what did he not hold on to? The, the deity. He held on to his deity. He was fully, uh, de uh, he was fully God, right? Yeah. Yes. So what do we mean when he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God? He did not hold on to his glorious estate and you can put your hand. His privilege and position. So what was that? What was the privilege? What did he not consider it robbery to be equal with God? What did he give up? He condescended, right? What did he? He came down in rank and dignity. How was he not equal with God in terms of receiving honor and worship? Remember? Okay. He did not seek to be honored and worshipped as God. So that is what it means. He did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Okay, very important. You can write down, uh, it's in your notes, but uh, you can make this point, you know. He did not, con he, he came down in rank or dignity. He did not consider to be honored or worshipped as God. Okay. Then we moved on to chapter 6. In chapter 6, we looked at the humanity of Christ. We discovered that Christ was really human 
in all areas. Uh, but even though he willingly restricted himself as a human being, he, as a human being, he was truly human in every sense, except in what area? Okay, are you listening? He was truly human in every sense, in every area, except as a, except that he was sinless. Yes. Okay, that's very important. He was truly human in every sense, except that he was sinless. Okay. Now, since uh, we understood the importance of his in incarnation, we look at well, we looked at the importance of incarnation in chapter five and six. We look at why was it necessary for Jesus to become a human being. Okay, so now we are going to basically having understood what incarnation is, that God is taking on human form, having examined his humanity of Christ, we will now summarize the why of the incarnation. What was, the, why did God have to become man? What was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man and take on the fullness of humanity? All of this is in your notes. You can just follow through. Okay, what was God doing through humanity uh, that he could not do in any other means? Why did God have to become a human being? Why did he have to be completely human? What, what was the necessity? Why could he not accomplish his purpose in any other way rather than just becoming a human being? So we, in this chapter, we are going to try to attempt these questions. What was the purpose of the incarnation? Why did Christ have to become a man? Why did he have to take on the fullness of humanity? What was God doing through the humanity of Christ that he uh, could not do in any other means? Okay, so in this chapter, we're going to attempt to answer these questions. And we're going to answer these questions by looking at our studying scripture passages like we have been doing uh, for the other chapters because when we study any doctrine we always have to study the doctrine in the light of scripture from genesis right up to revelation look at what each of them are telling and in the entirety of scripture we try to come to conclusions or draw our conclusions in the light of the entire scripture and not base our doctrines or our understanding about sin, salvation, Holy Spirit, angels, God, Trinity, based on just one scripture passage. Okay, so we're going to look at various scripture passages. The first one is Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So can somebody please read Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It's in your notes, so you can just read it out. Uh, where's the mic? Pass it on quickly. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. God, who is at various times and in various ways, spoke in past, in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom all also he made the worlds. Thank you. So in the past, that's talking about the Old Testament, talking, uh, you know, to the fathers, how did, uh, you know, um, God spoke to the prophets, okay? And they spoke what God told them. They told it to the people, thus says the Lord, and, you know, they told the people what God had spoken to them. So in the past, God spoke through the prophets, okay? He communicated his, his message, whatever he wanted to say to the people. He communicated it through the prophets. But in the fullness of time, in the Kairos time, in God's appointed time, you know, God sent his son and he spoke his word or communicated what he wanted to say through his son, who is the word, okay? So everything that God wanted to say, his final revelation, everything uh, he wanted to communicate to man, he has spoken or said or has made known through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is God's final and complete revelation to mankind. So in the incarnation of Jesus, we see God's final and complete um, revelation 
or whatever God wanted to communicate to man is seen in Jesus's incarnation. So incarnation is basically also God speaking to man, to human beings through the man, Jesus Christ. Okay, so incarnation is uh, one aspect of incarnation is God speaking to human beings uh, through the man Jesus Christ. You need to know that you know uh, here in the in Scripture it says you know through the man Jesus Christ. So pointing out that Jesus is fully human, human he had humanity in the fullest sense uh, in his entire fiber in his being. And it, he was the final revelation to whom God spoke to uh, mankind. Now, in your notes, there is a quote that says, Jesus Christ is the self-manifestation of God, the final culmination of all the acts of revelation of the old covenant and their fulfillment in the highest personal peculiar word of God. So some things that we can understand from this quote is the first thing is that Jesus is the image of God. He's a perfect, complete, exact a representation, copy of God. He's the exact, complete, perfect copy or representation of the nature of God or what God is really like. Okay, so in the incarnation, we have the complete revelation of the living God. Uh, we are able to uh, understand God. We are able to understand his ways, his nature, his characteristic, his way of doing things. And the other third thing that we can understand from this quote, which, which I just read, is that the, that the word who is Jesus Christ is God speaking to man. So God the Father speaking to God the Son and God the Son communicating that to mankind so it's god revealing himself to man through the person of jesus christ through the humanity of jesus christ so the word which is god, uh, which is jesus christ uh, is god manifested okay which means uh, uh, jesus christ made, manifested means made known uh, expressed who God is, his nature, his uh, his his ways of doing things, his characteristic. Everything is revealed in the person of Jesus Christ, and it's not something that we can't see or uh, can't uh, experience. But it's something that's manifest. It's something that is expressed, and that is why uh, God became man so that He can express who God is. And even as he expresses who God is, his nature, his characteristic, we are able to see, we are able to understand, we are able to relate to, we are able to touch and experience in a very, very real, personal and a tangible way. Okay. The last thing that we can understand from this quote is that the acts of God, the revelation of God in the Old Testament is completed and fulfilled in the highest and in the in a very personal way in the person and life of Jesus Christ. So all of the acts, all of the revelations, all of the prophecies that were spoken of in the Old Testament is completed and fulfilled in the highest sense, in the fullest sense, in the deepest sense, in a very personal way as well in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay. The next uh, ref, uh, the next point is that you know how when we're trying to understand or answer these questions about the purpose of incarnation, why God had to become man, why had to take on the fullness of humanity, uh, what was God doing through humanity of Christ that He could not do in any other means. The first thing is that you know um, through incarnation or through Christ uh, humanity. God's fullest revelation could uh, be seen, revealed, expressed uh, to mankind, you know, because Jesus became human. The second thing is that, you know, uh, Jesus was the only one who could reveal the Father in the fullest sense uh, to us as human beings and who we can see and understand and perceive and no, is because he's the only one who was in the bosom of the Father. Now, what does it mean when uh, when we read in Scripture that he's on the bosom of the Father? It 
bosom of the father means uh, you know very intimate to the father very close to the father you know uh, the mother always holds the child very close to her uh, to her her chest okay very close here to her heart uh, so that is this is called the bosom we are very you know so it's talking about great intimacy great love great uh, closeness great oneness great unity between the father and the uh, son so no one is is so close to the or uh, intimate or close to the father like the son is okay and so the the only person who could reveal this uh, 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 the heart of the father god or could reveal god's nature and characteristic is somebody who's very close to the father okay uh, now you know you can you are somebody who's very close to your father or mother and you are the best person who could can understand who could uh, relate and who can express what your far parents want so now for example if your uh, mother or father is unwell you know if my father or mother is unwell then the one who's very closest to them is able to relate to them and understand what they're saying they're doing they want okay now for example if you love dogs very much i'm not a dog lover but you know my sister loves dogs very much and we had uh, a golden retriever at home and any time um, his name is travis any time travis was unwell or anything he wanted he would go right up to my sister and tell her and she would just catch it like this if i he's if uh, she's not there he would not come to me because i'm not too close to him and even if he tries telling me i will not be able to understand but i don't know how she can understand he has a stomach ache or he is having a flea somewhere that is biting him that is troubling him or he's having a toothache i'm like how does she ever know what is wrong with travis which i'm not able to because you know they're so close they can understand they can relate she knows how to put him to bed where to make him sleep his bedding his food when he's sick what to do i just totally am clueless okay because i don't have that kind of relation that intimacy so the one who could who's very close is the best one who can actually reveal express um, make known the person that you are very close to like in a husband and wife the wife can express the husband and uh, make known the husband better than anybody else because they're so intimate they're so close the same way husband can express uh, and make known who the wife is or understand what the who the wife is or express who the wife is in clearer terms because they have a very intimate close relationship so the only one who could express god in the fullest and the best way is one who is very close and that is uh, jesus christ uh, and why is only jesus christ because uh, you know like i said in first timothy chapter 6 verse 16 it says no one has seen god you know or can see him because he lives in unapproachable light or timothy paul tells timothy you know uh, no one uh, god lives in unapproachable light who no man can see or can ever see or has ever seen so we can't see god we can never see him okay because he lives in this unapproachable holiness and awesomeness and might and splendor that he has but you know uh, and we could never fully know god but it's only through the person of jesus christ who became man was able to reveal the father heart of god to us so only when god became fully man that he fully revealed the nature of god the characteristic of god the works of god uh, to us and now we are having a clarity of who god is his nature his way of doing things his um, a deeper understanding of who god is is because it's revealed to us in the person and work of uh, jesus christ okay uh, like second corinthians 4:6 uh, can somebody read second corinthians 4:6 please for it is the god who commanded light to shine out of darkness who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of god in the face of jesus christ amen thank you nikhil so here we see that you know we were people living in darkness uh, we are living in we were living in sin uh, we are slaves of satan and uh, you know uh, we and we are also living in darkness when it came to our understanding of god 
Okay, we did not have a deeper understanding. If you look at Old Testament, they did not have a deeper understanding of, uh, uh, you know, the Trinity. But we have a deeper understanding because of the of the work of Jesus Christ and because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our midst. So we have a greater, deeper understanding of this knowledge of who God is, uh, uh, you know, because of Jesus Christ. But once we were living in darkness. Because of our sin, because we are slaves of Satan, we were away from God. We could not understand Him, and also, you know, we did not. Uh, we were living in darkness because uh, we did not have a complete understanding of who uh, God is. But Jesus Christ, who is the light, remember Jesus said, "I am the light of the." world one of the seven i am say sayings of jesus in john the gospel of john which john records for us and jesus is the light and he you know he brought about light in in the way of us understanding or giving us a knowledge of who uh, god is his way of doing things also gives us a better understanding of the knowledge uh, of god's glory what it means uh, of his manifest glorious uh, presence so in the incarnation the Son of God, who is intimately one with the Father, one in the bosom of the Father, like we read in John chapter 1, verse 18, okay, where John introduces Jesus as the Word, and he says, you know, uh, the, we have seen him full of grace and truth, you know, one who was in the bosom of the Father, who came to reveal the Father, to declare the Father to us, reveal the glory of the Father to us, as we read in uh, John chapter 1, verse 18. So the bosom of the Father means somebody who was very intimate, very close, and that was, uh, who, who, who was that? That is Jesus Christ, and he was the only one who could make known um, uh, God to us and he could not make known God to us if he came in deity because we can't see him we can't understand God we can't ex we can't uh, uh, you know uh, express uh, or understand or even uh, uh, experience his tangible presence if he came as deity if he came as God that is why he came fully as a human being he was fully God fully human but as fully human we could you know, see, touch, uh, you know, have that close relationship with him and understand who God is. Okay. So John chapter 1 verse 18, which says, No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father has uh, declared him. So there's no one else who is qualified to reveal the father to us. There's no one who is more intimately one with the father not even any angelic being. That is why God could not send any angel. Okay. No one had this honor excepting the son. And hence, it was only the son who could come and become fully human and, um, you know, reveal the father heart of God to us. So if somebody asks you a question, why did God have to become man? Why couldn't he choose some other human being? Why could he choose some angel? Then you know this how to answer it. Okay, John chapter one verse eighteen. Okay, and explain the bosom of the Father. Okay, the other thing is um, why was it important for God to become man? Why was it incarnation important? Uh, why did God have to take on the fullness of humanity? The third point is that you know uh, because He could suffer in the flesh. Okay, First Peter chapter three verse eighteen. Can somebody read that, please? First Peter chapter three verse eighteen. First Peter chapter three eighteen. For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but not alive by the Spirit. Okay, thank you. So in this verse, in First Peter chapter 3, verse 18, it tells us that Christ was put to death in the flesh. Okay? So some people say, you know, um, uh, even though he was hanging there as a human being, but he had become God. So he did not really go through all of those uh, pain and that suffering and all of those things. Uh, because look at him, you know, if anyone, any human being would have gone through, they wouldn't have lasted or they wouldn't have been able to endure it and all of that. So, you know, it was it was just human form, but he was, you know, he, tra he com transformed into being God at that moment. But here we see that for Christ also suffered for the sins. He was put to death in the 
flesh very important scripture passage okay so it was not that he suffered as be, uh, in a, um, or he was crucified as being deity we could not do that to deity we could not do that to god because if he was god we could not even touch him right because you know and we could not we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to even see him okay because he's god he's uh, lives in unapproachable light we no man can even touch him can even leave alone see him touch him also okay so he suffered in was put to death in the flesh in his human body therefore you know the human body provided a means for christ to uh, die so the reason why god became man another reason is so that you know he could uh, you know suffer for us take on the sins of the humankind die in our place uh, you know and defeat sin and defeat death and satan on the cross and for that he had to be fully human so that he can identify with us so that he can take upon the sins of the human uh, mankind upon himself now if he was god if he was deity he could not take on the sins of the entire human kind on himself because god is holy you know sin cannot come near him sin cannot even touch uh, sin cannot even touch him so if he had to take on the sins of the entire human race that means he can't be deity he has to be man okay so he came as fully man so that he could take on the sins and also what is the consequence of sin death so he had to die in our place so that he can you know do away with sin uh you know do away with death break the power of sin break the power of death and also you know defeat satan on the cross yes uh, chira you have a question I'm just now we read like john 1 8 right no one seen god at any time it means like no angels no one can see including angels also or yeah when it says no one uh, it means no one okay i'm not sure about the angelic beings uh but it says that he lives in unapproachable light who no man can see as no man can see or has ever seen it qualifies there as man uh, but um, not sure about the angelic beings whether they can because god lives in such uh, great glory and awesomeness and splendor so i don't think that even the angelic beings can even uh, see him but here in this verse says you know uh, in first timothy chapter 6 verse 16 says who no man has seen or can ever see qualifies but we can check on the angelic beings and let you know good question Okay, um, so we'll move on. Um, so the purpose of his death was so that he might you know, bring us back to God. Yes. 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 Yes, bosom of the Father is very, very close. Uh, so very intimately one yes so nobody can even approach uh, accepting god the son <clears throat> yes so the bosom of the father is only jesus had the honor because he was intimately close so no even not even angelic beings had that privilege of being intimately close with um, that close uh, with the godhead yes can you take the mic please yeah I mean, can we consider like this? I mean, uh, the bosom, bosom, and this uh, seeing is different. Like, uh, so angelic beings can see the father, but uh, they don't have the bosom with the father. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, uh, angelic beings, you're saying, can because the word see and bosom is uh, two different words. Yes. Uh, but I'm also not, don't have much clarity whether angels can uh, see. But of course, they receive orders from God. But um i don't think they can they can see that is this is what i think but uh, i can just back it up with scripture verse and you know uh, give you that uh, uh, answer that question okay um so it was through his death that you know uh, he accomplished so many things one of the things that he accomplished through his death was that he we could be made blameless and without 
guilt. So when he took upon the sins of the entire mankind, uh, it was one way that, you know, he could do away with sin, break the power of sin, and we could be blameless, which means without fault, without sin, without guilt. And it was through his death that we could, you know, be presented holy and blameless without any accusation, without any guilt before God the Father. Okay, so one thing that Christ accomplished through his death as, you know, being fully human was so that, you know, we could be blameless so that we have access before God. We can be presented before God blameless, holy, uh, without any accusations, without any uh, guilt. Okay, and it was also because of his death that we are being, uh, we have been reconciled back to God. What does being reconciled mean? Uh, forgiven come together yes you know it's basically uh, our relationship with god was severed uh, we you know was uh, uh, was we were far away from him our relationship with him has broken fellowship with him is broken because of uh, sin but once jesus died on the cross he not only pronounced us blameless and holy before the father and guiltless free from sin but also through his death, we have been reconciled back to God. That means we have access back to God. We can relate to God. We can approach this throne of grace freely. Um, uh, you know, we are friends with him. We are sons, daughters uh, of God. Uh, we can relate to him. We can hear him uh, speak to us. As it says, in, as we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. Can somebody read that, please? Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation, that is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespass to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Amen. Thank you. So here he's saying that, you know, God has uh, reconciled us back to himself. The very purpose that God created us was for what? Why did he create Adam? To have a relationship, a fellowship with, uh, uh, with Adam. But when that was broken because of sin, God, you know, through time past, you know, tried various means of reconciling himself back with mankind, bringing back mankind back to himself but then in the fullness of time he sent his son and who died on the cross and through Jesus' death on the cross he reconciled us back to God so now we are no longer strangers we are no longer enemies uh, of God we are now friends sons daughters of God we have that access and that fellowship so it was God who was reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ. So God was not holding on to the sins of the world uh, or sins of the people against them. Why? Because the sins of the world or the sins of the people was fully paid. It was a done, completed thing because of what Jesus did on the cross. And because the payment was made, the penalty for sin was paid once for all, complete. Jesus, God was able to reconcile the world back to him himself. And so through Jesus Christ, you know, um, God has reconciled us back to himself and also that we have been reconciled back to God. That means we have been brought together to God. We are close to God. We have this intimate relationship, this oneness. And that is why we can call him Abba. Okay, not just like father in the Old Testament. They knew God as a father. But it was a very different understanding of the father, a father who was uh, strict, a father who would, you know, punish them. Sin was dealt with there and there itself. You know, uh, a father who was strict, was a father who was authoritative, supreme, sovereign. But the, uh, the father heart of God that Jesus revealed was the... Uh, is Abba. Abba is a more very intimate, close, uh, you know, relationship that one can have with their 
father. So it's not here that a father is sovereign, uh, one who uh, punishes sin, one who is, uh, you know, is, uh, there's curse pronounced when sin is uh, done. But here, you know, sin has been dealt with. So here we have a God who is, you know, loving, gracious, compassionate, merciful, uh, slow to anger, abounding in love and forgiving. Okay. So that is the uh, a different concept of God, of the Father heart of God that Jesus came to reveal to us that he is a Abba Father who can be very close and all of these attributes of um, God. Look at what Colossians chapter 1 verses 21 and 22 say. Can somebody read that please? And you who once were alienated and the enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Amen. So thank you. And in this verse is in Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. We see how we were enemies of God. You know, we were alienated. Alienated means what? Aliens means far away. We just didn't know about God. Just totally separated. There was a huge gap. Okay, we are enemies of God in our minds, but yet now we have been reconciled back to God. And how we've been reconciled to God in the body of his flesh. Again, talking about the humanity of God, Jesus Christ, through his death. And through his death, he presented us holy and blameless, uh, you know, beyond reproach in his sight. And also that we have been reconciled to God. So another purpose of incarnation was, you know, so that there was a body that was provided uh, through this body, you know, um, God was able to deal with uh, sin, death and Satan. And it was, you know, somebody who identified with the human race, somebody who could take on the human, uh, the sins of human man, uh, of uh, the human race or mankind and could die in our place. Okay, so somebody who had to identify with us, with our sins, somebody would also die in our place. And that is what was the reason why or the purpose of incarnation, why God became fully man so that it facilitated, facilitated Christ's physical death through which we could be made blameless without reproach, be made holy in his sight and also be reconciled back to God. So his, through his death, God and man are um, reconciled. We'll read another scripture passage, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 and 20. Can somebody read that, please? Hebrews chapter Hebrews. 10, 19 and 20. Amen. Thank you. So here we see that, you know, uh, through Jesus' death on the cross, you know, when Jesus died, remember the curtain of the temple that separated the holy from the holy of holies? And the holy of holies, only the priest had access, only uh, one one day in a year day of atonement okay but that temp that curtain of that uh, you know that separated the holy place and the holy of holies was torn into two which means now we have anyone has access before uh, you know the holy of holies that means we have access before this god who's who lives in unapproachable light who's extremely holy who's um, you know utterly holy and um, we have access and what gave us this access it says and what gave us this confidence to go enter this holy of holies it's because of the blood of jesus christ now look at how the writer of hebrews very beautifully puts it you know even when the high priest used to enter the holy of holies on the day of atonement that is one day in the year he would go you know enter that curtain and go into the holy of holies he would have actually uh, sacrificed a bull for himself, we'll we'll study that for his own sins, and also would have sacrificed the goat uh, for the sins of of uh, the entire Israelite nation community, and he would take that blood of that bull 
which he made as a sacrifice for his sins and as for the uh, that goat which he made for the sacrifice of the sins of uh, the Israel entire Israel community he would take that blood and he would sprinkle it on the ark of the covenant which is you know the mercy seat now we have the ark of the covenant that is placed in the holy of holies and on the cover of the ark of the covenant are two cherubims two angels with their wings you know covered like this and in between that is the mercy seat where god would come and relate to man just imagine this holy god you know who lives in unapproachable holiness and greatness and um, and light you know he would actually come and this high priest man who is sinful would have access to you know not see god because he would come in his in his great awesomeness and glory and light uh, but would be able to speak and hear god in a very tangible in a very real way so for that to happen and for the for the high priest not to fall down dead because of his sin you know he would sprinkle that blood on that mercy seat and also would sprinkle the blood of the goat that represented the sins of the son and the sins would be atoned for and god would come and meet man and god would uh, you know man would have access to god and so beautifully you know the 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 writer of hebrews pictures this whole thing and he brings in what jesus did on the cross and he says his blood was sprinkled for us shed for us and um, by a new living way which is he's talking about the new covenant uh, by the new covenant we have access to god uh, without any sacrifice because jesus made the full sufficient perfect sacrifice and says he opened the curtain for us and so beautifully the writer of hebrew says this curtain is actually his body i mean amazing way you know the holy spirit leads and he writes you know he says you know the curtain is torn but this curtain is not just that physical curtain but it is the body of christ that was broken in you know and shed for the blood that was shed for us so that we have access and don't you you know aren't you excited that you know we have access we can approach this holy god this great awesome mighty god you know because of what jesus did for us on the uh, cross we can hear him speak we can receive answers for our problems challenges difficulties uh, we can share our bur burdens with him he counsels us he helps us we don't need any counselor we don't need anybody we can go to we can just go uh, to god it's we have this great access to the work of the holy spirit to god to him uh, hearing him speak to us is because of what jesus did on the uh, cross so because of jesus that we have this boldness to go before god in a new and living way isn't that amazing so every time you you know you go on your knees or you spend time in prayer don't take that prayer time very very lightly you know honor that because you are in the presence of the holy god you know we need to honor that we know that you know we have access to this god who's hearing us uh, speak with which the old testament people did not have and we are going to hear him speak it's because of what jesus did so you know just live in that great sense of awe and respect uh, to what god, jesus has done on the cross and what access we have and what grace we have you know make use of the spiritual gifts the spiritual inheritance that you have received because uh, of what jesus has done and your faith in and belief in what jesus has completed on the cross okay we'll stop here and uh, we'll meet after the break after break we'll take any questions or doubts that you have okay Thank you everyone we'll see you after the break